This audio version of Hearts of Purpose by Gail Grace Nordskog has been produced by Reconstructionist Radio and narrated by the hosts of the Monstrous Regiment podcast. Please visit reconstructionistradio.com to access the rest of this audiobook and many more. 5. Julie Dawson YWAM Youth with a Mission Townsville, Australia Oxnard, California Kona, Hawaii Focus to bring healing to the nations through the multiplication of medical ships and the gospel of Jesus Christ, to disciple nations through evangelism and the multiplication of leadership schools for the South Pacific and Asia. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Revelation 4.11 When we allow God to have his way in our lives, we give him pleasure. Our happiness becomes His happiness. The Bible says that Jesus is the first of many brethren. That means that we are His family, the first of His line, and that we will experience much that He experienced, including suffering and going to the cross, where we lay down our rights as Jesus did. God is not the author of suffering, but we live in a fallen world with an enemy who is the author of pain and suffering. The enemy meant it for evil, but, as Joseph said, God meant it for good. Genesis 50:20 We are prisoners of hope and we know that all things work together for good. Romans 8:28 June 2014 As I looked at the screen in front of me I saw a young boy about 5 years old. He was from Papua New Guinea. His beautiful brown face and big brown eyes captured my heart. His name was Victor. Victor spoke about his love for his country and its beauty and diversity. Medical care, dental care, and education were just a few of the challenges his country was facing. My heart was moved. Before joining YWAM, Youth with a Mission, in 1972, I had wanted to become a nurse. And, as I sat in the audience that day, I thought that maybe my desire to serve on the mission field in a country that needed medical help might actually come true. I had served YWAM in many capacities for over 40 years, but now my children were married. Rachel, our daughter, was about to be married. John and I were entering a season of new possibilities. John had been involved with YWAM medical ships for a long period of time, but doors were about to open for me to participate with him in bringing healing to the nations through the love of Jesus and medical help. 1962, looking back. Oh no, where is it? I can't have lost it again. I can only imagine what mom is going to say. Oh God, can you help me find my retainer? My eyes immediately fell upon a plastic glass on my headboard above my bed. I crossed the room and looked inside the cup. My retainer! There it was, sitting on the bottom of my cup where I had left it a few nights ago. I was nine years old at the time, and this was my first experience with answered prayer. There is a God, and He answers childlike faith. I was raised in a Catholic home. We weren't overly religious, but we were in church every Sunday, and I attended catechism classes once a week while growing up. We were taught to believe that there is a God, that He sent His Son to die for our sins, and that we could be reconciled to Him. My father's German family had emigrated to the U.S. from Russia just before World War I. All of my grandmother's family who stayed behind in Russia was starved to death under Joseph Stalin during the purges. I have always been grateful for the Lord's protection over my family and for a grandfather who followed God's leading and took his family to a land of refuge, America. Three families of Schmaltzes sailed from Liverpool, England and passed through Ellis Island on their way to a new life. Being farmers, they settled in North Dakota, where my grandfather built a sod house for his family. They planted wheat and raised dairy cows, and in time they built a big wooden home where they raised their large family. My dad spoke German until he was eight years old. He went to a one-room schoolhouse for farmer's children in the area. Dad was one of twelve children and the youngest of nine boys. He had been chosen by his parents to be trained for the Catholic priesthood. When Dad was ready for junior high school, he was sent to be educated in a seminary in the Midwest. Fortunately, upon graduating, Dad told his parents that he wanted to be a music teacher instead of a priest, for which I have always been very grateful. Dad met my mother at McPhail's Music College in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They were married in Wells, Nevada, just before Dad was shipped to Japan during the time the U.S. was fighting in Korea. 
Dad returned from the war and picked up my mother and me where we had been staying with his parents in Dickinson, North Dakota. He moved us to Cherry Street in San Francisco, California. Then he and Mom finally settled in Santa Rosa, north of the Bay Area, where they had three more children. Dad was a highly respected music teacher and became a trumpet player in the local symphony orchestra and a piano player in nightclubs on the weekends. Mom was an awesome mother. We always had good, healthy meals and were well taken care of. From her, I learned that being a wife and mother was a high calling that should be valued in society. As our American culture moves further and further away from godly values found in the Bible, we are finding more and more suffering families. Remote fathers preoccupied with work, mothers juggling too much work inside and outside the home, and children struggling to find their way in cruel and godless environments. All of this is putting tremendous stress on families. What I do know is that God will help us with the huge challenges that face the modern family, families that need mothers and fathers with a sense of parenthood's important calling. Parents are their children's barometer and their compass in this world. 1970. Looking back, I found myself again in my bedroom, crying out to God, Can you help me? This time I was 17 years old and struggling with an eating disorder. The term they use today for this disorder is BED, binge eating disorder. In 1970, I don't recall there was a name for what was happening to me. My mother was bewildered, but supportive as always. I was trapped in a cycle of binge eating followed by fasting. As I became more conscious of my appearance, my sense of worth began to suffer. I became trapped in society's value system. I didn't have the hourglass figure that was so highly prized. As I struggled to diet to get a shape I wanted, I became more and more trapped in a binge and fasting cycle. Thankfully, I never was bulimic. As the firstborn, I began looking outside of my family for approval at an early age. My identity became based on how others than my family viewed me. I began trying to please people and to get a sense of value from what I saw reflected from the mirror in their eyes. When we get our sense of value from what we see reflected from others, we become fragile and needy and insecure, needing a lot of affirmation. Slowly over time, I learned to allow myself to stand before one mirror for my identity. I spent time learning what the Word of God says about identity. I do not receive glory from men. You receive glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God, Jesus said, John 5:41 and 44. What should our value be based on? I believe that we are valuable because we are loved by God and we are unique. There is no one like you or me, and never will be again. God loves diversity. God is making something amazing in every person's life, and we need to celebrate what God is making. At that point in my life, I knew there was a God, but I didn't know Him. Tormented and needing a Savior, I called out to God. My search for Jesus began in earnest. I knew that Jesus died for my sins, but somehow I had never become born again. When I understood that Jesus loved me and had a plan for my life, I wanted to read my Bible and know Him. Young Life Organization was active in my high school, and I started to go to their meetings. My parents were also experiencing an awakening in their spiritual lives. My mother, upon visiting her father on his deathbed, realized that she had nothing to say to him to comfort him. She couldn't say with certainty that there was a heaven and if we would all be there together again some day. She knew that she believed in God but wasn't able to lead her father into the saving knowledge of Christ. After his death, she began to search for a real relationship with God. Within three years, my parents, my brother, and my two sisters and I were all born again and learning to follow the Lord. It was the early 1970s, and God was moving. As God revealed His unconditional love for me, I learned to trust Him and accept His righteousness. Within a few more years, I was completely delivered from the eating disorder that had plagued me. One evening, my mother reached out, gave me a hug, and told me she loved me. God moves through love. As she spoke words of affirmation, Jesus touched me with his love. My mother knew my struggles, and she showed me compassion. I received a measure of deliverance and healing that night. One might say that this sounds too easy. It was. After another divine appointment with the Holy Spirit, in which he touched me with a father's love, I was completely set free from the desire to overeat. 
I was so impacted by this supernatural deliverance that I forever knew that God heals and delivers his people from their afflictions. After graduating from Montgomery High School in Santa Rosa, California, I began to attend the Samuel Merritt School of Nursing in Oakland, California. I enjoyed my training as a student nurse. I also attended science classes at Cal State Hayward a short distance away. My habit was to go home on the weekends since Santa Rosa was about an hour and a half drive from Oakland. I looked forward to being with my family and attending youth group at church. One Friday night, a team from YWAM was visiting my church. I was very excited as I settled into my seat. A young man named John was on the platform in the front of the church teaching about sharing Jesus on the streets. He had long blonde hair and a thick accent which sounded British to me. After his teaching, he led about 25 of us young people to the neighborhood mall where we shared Jesus whenever we had an open door. I was on John's team. I discovered that he was from New Zealand. At this point, I had no idea where New Zealand was on the World Atlas. John patiently explained that New Zealand was at the bottom of the world, not too far from Australia. Yes, I did know where Australia was. He told us that he was traveling up the coast of California, visiting different churches where the team from YWAM would teach students in youth groups and then take us out witnessing. This was in the early 1970s, and the Jesus People revival was just beginning. Dwayne Peterson was an important influence at this time, and he was publishing the Hollywood Free Paper. I knew that kids had been streaming into the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco where, among the flower children, a culture of drugs and free love was in full bloom. Resultant activities destroyed lives, and disillusionments were setting the stage for a revival among young people. Many were hungry for God's love. Later, I found out that when John was speaking to the crowd of kids in my youth group, his eyes fell on me, and he heard the Holy Spirit say, That's your wife. He became curious about me. While his team stayed in Santa Rosa, we started getting to know each other. After John's team left, we kept in contact. It was a long-distance courtship since I was still going to school in Oakland, and John was pioneering a training school for traveling teams and recruiting volunteers for upcoming outreaches overseas. For many months, John had to drive back and forth from Southern California to Northern California to see me, which was about a 300-mile trip one way. We then found ourselves further apart when I spent a summer of service in Africa, and John continued his pioneering of YWAM in Hawaii. We communicated through the mail, sometimes with great difficulty because of the chaotic political situation in Ethiopia, where I spent about six weeks with a YWAM team. We were a team of three Americans, one young Englishwoman, and two girls and one young man from Denmark. Our leader was a great young woman from Sweden. We spent time teaching and singing in the open air and in churches and in doing evangelism. We often stayed with different missionaries in the area, and we all had remarkable stories of how God coordinated our schedules. Baptist missionaries from the U.S. and missionaries from Norway, Sweden, and Denmark were kind to us. I greatly admired these folks who were so far away from home but loved the people they worked with, making their lives better and leading them to Christ. God started to speak to our team leader about making a trip from Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, to Asmara, the capital of Eritrea, which would involve a three-day bus trip through mountainous terrain. We were going to meet a Baptist missionary from the U.S. and spend time working with his young people. One evening, after a long day of travel, we were met by a missionary who was led by the Holy Spirit to our bus station just as we had arrived. God had spoken to him that a team of young missionaries was traveling and needed a place to stay for the night which he could provide. Our team leader was so grateful since she had organized much of our trip through faith, believing that God would provide opportunities for ministry and would meet our physical needs. May 19, 1973 was John's and my wedding day. As I stood in my church on my father's arm, I thought, Lord, I don't know this person I am marrying very well. I knew that God had put us together, and we had submitted our relationship to both sets of parents, and they had given their consent. However, John and I hadn't spent much time together. As I walked toward John, I thought about Isaac and Rebecca, two people in the Bible who hadn't known each other at all, but who were joined together. My heart was flooded with peace. I knew that the man whom God had chosen for me was the best choice I could make and that I was safe and secure in God's will. I loved and respected John. 
Over the years that followed, I could never have imagined the role of leadership that John would play in the world. We began a training ministry in two Spanish-style houses in Sunland, a suburb of Los Angeles, California. God also released a seven-acre property in an African-American local community just five miles away. Other operating locations were pioneered in Hollywood, Pasadena, San Pedro, and Long Beach, with many more developed throughout the western U.S. and several countries. David, our first child, was born in 1976. What a courageous child and what a gift! He is now a pastor of a church in Curitiba, Brazil, and an educator of missionary leaders. He is the father of three wonderful children and husband to a multi-talented Brazilian named Katie. Our second son, Paul, was born in 1978. What a delight he is! He is the operations manager for Wild Planet Adventures. He has a wonderful, courageous wife named Amber and two beautiful little girls. After Paul was born, I had a dream in which the Lord told me, You are going to have a little girl, but it will be a long time before she arrives. Our son Matt arrived four years later. Our friend Dan Sneed called and said, This baby will be a great blessing from God. And he was, and still is. I smiled every time I thought of him while he was growing up. He was happy and good-natured. He married a gifted, godly woman from France named Aurora, and they have four children. They are YWAM missionaries to the Pacific and Asia and are based in New Zealand. But where was our little girl? God blessed us with a house next to our ministry headquarters and school facilities in Lakeview Terrace, just a few miles from our original location in Sunland. Being a leader with a wonderful teaching ministry and with a gift of wisdom, John was much in demand around the world. He also never had trouble finding people to follow him, so we had great people working in our outreach programs and schools. Since we had three boys growing up together, I decided that the best thing I could do for the body of Christ was to release my husband. I assumed much of the responsibilities around the home, since John was pioneering in the city and traveling much of the time. I headed up our hospitality ministry on our campus, as well as leading prayer meetings for the women. Was I lonely and overwhelmed at times? Yes, but the Bible says we must pick up our cross and follow him, and he who loses his life will gain it. He who gains his life will lose it. During our times of separation, I received a wonderful closeness with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that he will be a father to the fatherless and a husband to the widow, Psalm 68, 5. I needed a father since my dad had passed away from a heart attack unexpectedly when I was still a young wife and mother, and when John was out of town, I needed a husband too. I learned to take my needs for provision, protection, and identity to God the Father. Jesus was my Savior, friend, and companion. The Holy Spirit was my teacher and comforter and nurtured me when I needed to be strengthened. As the years passed, Youth with a Mission, YWAM, became a large global missions network. John became prominent both as a missions statesman and as a leader within the rapidly growing global prayer movement. He was always organizing something. These included the Los Angeles Olympic Outreach, the North American Marches for Jesus, the Love Los Angeles Pastors Network, the response to the Cambodian Genocide, and many more global initiatives. Perhaps most surprising was the birth of a global network of Christian reconcilers known as the International Reconciliation Coalition, IRC. At one point, John was in Arnhem, Holland, speaking at a large reconciliation event honoring the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II. Many Germans came hoping for reconciliation with the Dutch and participants from across Europe. My favorite report of this event is about a Polish dancer. The planners had given opportunity for diverse cultural expressions of worship. At one point, the leader of the Polish dance troupe fell heavily on her hip. She rose quickly and continued dancing her worship. Later, John honored the Spirit of God and the Polish people before the crowd by saying, The Polish people may fall and be injured, but they are the first to get up. And indeed they were, showing courage and strength in a movement that eventually led to the fall of the Iron Curtain. Sometime during this event, a friend of ours came up to John and said, I had a vision this morning of you walking along the beach with your daughter. John graciously said, Thank you, but dismissed this picture, thinking maybe she had seen a daughter-in-law or a granddaughter, neither of which we had at the time. We had long since given up on having our own daughter. 
When he returned home, he said to me, Guess what? He then described our friend's vision. We both laughed. At this time, I was 41 years old, and John was 43. We were happy with our almost grown-up family. David was 19 and working in Los Angeles with the Dream Center in YWAM. Paul was 17 and just finishing high school. Matt was 13 and attending junior high school. John was busy with YWAM and the IRC, and I was getting a degree in interior design at the Los Angeles Mission College. I was especially looking forward to being able to travel more with John. The movie Father of the Bride 2 was in the theaters at the time. It was a funny movie about an older couple who experienced an unexpected pregnancy. I remember thinking, wouldn't that be fun? Well, when it happened to me a year later, I wasn't so sure. A baby was coming, and I was going to be a mother again at age 43. Both John and I were shocked. Being prepared to welcome another baby was going to take some getting used to. Could this be our little girl, I wondered? God had said we would wait a long time, and this did qualify as a long time. Once again, we had to wait until she was born to know if God was fulfilling his word. Rachel arrived on October 10, 1996. We were delighted. We put her under the Christmas tree two months later with a big red bow on her head. She was our Christmas present that year. Two years later, we received an invitation from the United Pastors of Ventura County on the northern edge of Los Angeles. They offered us their full support in going global, and we moved to a house and office near the coast. When I saw John walking on the beach with little Rachel, her tiny hand clasping his fingers as the waves met her little feet, I knew that every aspect of the prophetic word had come true. In 2003, John was asked to be the president of YWAM. He was elected by a group of his peers during a YWAM staff conference in Nanning, China. We were delighted to have this opportunity to lead the 12,000, now 25,000, missionaries worldwide within our organization. God spoke to us out of Isaiah 51.1, Return to the rock from which you were hewn, they who were few are now many. This spoke to us of an alignment with the vision, values, and calling of YWAM. We also felt a need to honor Lauren and Darlene Cunningham, the founders, and also those many others who had pioneered YWAM and bequeathed it to the nations. Also at this time, John received a prophetic word from several people referencing the life of Samuel the prophet in the Old Testament. Before the time of Saul, Samuel served as a judge and prophet in Israel. He lived and ministered while on an annual circuit through four locations, Ramah, his birthplace, Mizpah, Israel's gathering place, plus Bethel and Gilgal. We established an office in Auckland, New Zealand, to serve as a base for the Pacific and Asia, over 70% of the world's population. We also established a communications office in Los Angeles for North America, an arrangement with our son David in Curitiba, Brazil, as a base for South America, and a small apartment near the University of the Nation's campus in Kona, Hawaii, in order to use the campus as a gathering place for international leaders. These became the basis of our circuit. When John was commissioned as president, he was charged with three things. One, the morale of the mission. Two, the multiplication of medical ships. And three, an emphasis on evangelism. This season of our life still continues, and we are engaged with many countries and people groups during the course of every year, sometimes living for an extended period wherever we run leadership schools, one such being a training program for staff from Papua New Guinea. This was a fulfillment of the compassion for the people of Papua New Guinea that entered my heart that day in June 2014, starting my journey back to medical missions. August 27, 2010 I was rushing around the house getting ready to go to a doctor's appointment. I had just returned from picking up John at the Los Angeles airport where he was returning from a two-week trip to Brazil. We were so excited to be back together again. We always spent the 90-minute trip driving back to Oxnard, California, where we were living, talking about our adventures. John had exciting things to share with me. I loved listening to him tell about all the people he had ministered to and hearing about what God was doing around the world. The doctor had made an appointment with me to discuss a recent mammogram. I was curious, but not worried. I had found a lump a few months earlier in one breast, but wasn't concerned. As far as I knew, there was no breast cancer in my family and no reason to worry. While sitting in a room waiting for the doctor, I was reminded of a scripture I had felt quickened by a few nights before. 
I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Psalm 118.17 It was an interesting scripture, and I received it with gratitude, but was mildly curious as to why the Holy Spirit was sending me that scripture. Dying? At about 4.15 p.m., Dr. Byrne walked into my visiting room and announced, You have stage 1 breast cancer. I was stunned. Breast cancer? My cancerous lump tested positive for estrogen and progesterone. I was one of many women who had been told to use bioidentical hormone replacement by an endocrinologist. I had gratefully accepted her advice. Many can take HRT safely, it would seem, but not me. I asked my surgeon how long she thought that the cancerous growth had been growing. She said it was probably three years. This meant that my cancer would have started in the first months of my beginning to take hormone replacement. Immediately I stopped taking HRT. I found a good oncologist and a surgeon. I would need a lumpectomy and then six weeks of radiation treatment. Thankfully, my doctor, Dr. Montez, didn't insist on chemotherapy. Chemotherapy would have given me a 4% edge toward survival, but my doctor didn't think it was worth the trauma for me. Good news. I shed many tears and tried to find peace. I was 57 years old. Rachel was now 14. I found myself struggling with fear. Was I going to survive, only to have cancer return in a few years, as it did with so many men and women? Was I going to drag my family through years of heartbreak as I struggled with disease and trauma? I had a strong faith in God, but during many times over my years of being a believer, I had wondered what part faith plays in supernatural healing. So many who pray and believe for healing remain sick and die. One thing I had realized was, don't ask God a question if you are not prepared to learn the answer. God takes our questions seriously. My journey toward a greater understanding of faith and the power that's released when we believe what the Bible says was life-changing. Hebrews 11.1 1 spoke straight to my heart. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Other scriptures that came to mind were John 6.63, It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing, and James 5.15, and the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. I also referred to 1 Peter 1, seven about the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes. Smith Wigglesworth, a great healing evangelist from England, once said, The truths you stand for, you are tried for. This was becoming a reality for me. Treatment for different types of cancer has improved over the years, but many people still perish. I have learned to never compare myself with anyone else. As 2 Corinthians 10.12 reveals, comparing myself with others weakens my faith in God's promise to heal me. Living in supernatural health, health that is energized by God, became a focus for me. How could I access God's healing in my body? My doctor at one point said, Your body makes cancer. You will deal with the potential return of this disease for the rest of your life. These were, and are, scary words, but I encouraged myself in the Lord and began to seek Him for revelation about His healing principles. Although I greatly appreciate medical science and I value doctors, I knew that I needed to turn to the greatest physician to teach me to stay well and healthy. Medical science these days is telling us that up to 80% of disease can be emotionally based. Are we making ourselves sick? Are we causing our bodies to break down due to stress and fear? Emotional wounds received as early as childhood can become strongholds which the enemy exploits to oppress men and women. Satan is called the father of lies. He wants to put his identity upon us, usurping God's role of our loving Heavenly Father. Our Father God says, You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Meanwhile, the enemy whispers, You are worthless, with no value. You should feel ashamed and rejected. God speaks to us all in Jeremiah. I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and not for evil, plans to give you a future and a hope. As I struggled with fear, the Holy Spirit comforted me. Psalm 119.92 became a sweet place for me to rest. Unless your law had been my delight, I would then have perished in my affliction. Psalm 124.7 also brought me hope and promise. The snare is broken and we have escaped. One time I woke up in the middle of the night hearing songs of praise and scripture which brought me peace. I realized that the Holy Spirit was singing to me. During the day, I often experienced anxiety and fear, 
And then the scripture would come to me from 1 John 4.18, Perfect love casts out fear. Why was I afraid? In the book of Genesis, it is told that man and woman experienced fear after they became separated from God. When Adam and Eve chose to question God's motive and wisdom, and when they ate the forbidden fruit, they were expelled from God's Garden of Eden. Mankind has been trying to get back into God's garden ever since and to be rid of fear. Fear will always be a father issue. God's answer to fear is, be rooted and grounded in love. Ephesians 3.17 This became my lifeline. This scripture is enclosed within another verse. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. When we look at the cross, who was there? Peter was nowhere to be found. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was standing so that Jesus could see him while he was dying on the cross. Jesus was able to speak to John and give him an assignment. To him, Jesus said about his mother Mary, Behold your mother, John 19.27. Why was John the only one of the twelve disciples at the cross? Because he was focused on being a beloved disciple, not on what he could do for Jesus. This became my goal. Like Mary, I wanted to sit at the feet of my Father God. The Word became my daily bread. Taking communion became my daily routine. I found that spending time at the foot of the cross, in my prayer closet, taking the elements that represent the body and blood of Christ, and remembering what Jesus did there, caused my fear to disappear. I would meditate on the story of the first Passover, and that when over two million Hebrews left Egypt, not one was sick. That was a miracle of healing. The enemy, the devil, who is the author of fear, fled. Often I would take communion two or three times a day during those first months after my diagnosis, and I would read 1 Peter 2.24, by whose, Jesus' stripes, you were healed. I visualized every lash that fell on Jesus as purchasing my healing. When I took the cup, I would quote Revelation 12.11 in my heart, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. I learned to take every thought captive and to think about what was coming out of my mouth. Even Jesus said on his journey to the cross in John 14.30, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. Our words become a snare. Was I speaking words of affirmation? Did I complain too often? The Bible says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, Proverbs 17.22. God gave me this scripture when a doctor wanted to give me a prescription with dangerous side effects. I instead had God the great physician's prescription from Proverbs 17:22, have a merry heart. I began a journey toward what I like to call living in supernatural health, health that is only explained by the grace of God. When one has a disease that has no cure and is one from which many die, one needs to look to the divine physician, the divine healer for wisdom. Trauma is stored in the cells of our body. There is a book entitled The Quiet Leader by David Rock that tells us that any experience that is powerful is not forgotten, it is stored. As we go through life, any experience that feels like the first trauma will be stored in the same memory. This is how a stronghold is formed. Our strongholds and beliefs can keep us sick and captive to sickness and disease. Jesus came to set us free. I have now been declared a cancer survivor. I have been cancer free for over six years. In the beginning of my cancer ordeal, I often wondered if I would ever live without fear. Well, I can say, fear is never of God, and fearful thoughts should be taken captive and rejected. The enemy bombards our minds with ungodly thoughts in an attempt to see what we will agree with. When we agree with him, instead of what God's word says, we experience stress, fear, and anxiety. I have learned to say that fear is never of God and should always be rejected, never agreed with. Faith is a powerful force. On his way to the house of Jairus to heal his daughter, Jesus feels power go out from him to heal. Who touched me? asks Jesus. Jesus, who is full of purpose and in the midst of a large crowd, knows when faith has been exercised and his healing has been the response. Faith will elicit a response from God. Jesus says to the woman who touched him, My daughter, your faith has made you well. 
Go in peace and be healed of your trouble. Luke 8, 43-48 All things are subject to God, and some who are prayed for will be healed, and some will not. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Philippians 1, 21 Some will graduate early, having finished their race here on earth. The generational wells of healing that were started in Spokane, Washington, under the leadership of John G. Lake, were reopened on July 22, 1999. This movement, called the Healing Rooms, is now operating all over the world with doors open to the wounded, sick, and oppressed. I attend meetings at our healing room in Ventura, near our office in Oxnard, where a team of men and women meet to pray, build faith in one another, and explore the ways of God in healing. We are passionate about healing prayer. Healing can be received in a moment, but some healings take time. We shouldn't get discouraged when we have to contend for our healing. Even Jesus ministered to one man twice in Mark 8:23 through 25 There are many healing principles in the Bible that need to be absorbed over time in order for us to walk in health and wholeness, some of which I have touched upon. As I travel with John these days, I look for opportunities to pray for the body of Christ to be healed. I pray for open doors so that I can share my testimony. As of this writing, John and I are focused on bringing YWAM medical ships to a new level of effectiveness worldwide. John is personally involved in the battle to bring relief and development and medical services to Melanesia at a new level. In addition to the surgeries on board the ships, the backbone of the field activities continues to be to improve child survival and improve maternal health. This is achieved through collaborative mobile clinics in areas where provincial and district health teams are currently not able to meet the needs of the population. Ophthalmology and oral health are a significant focus of our field activities. YWAM medical ships are committed to an holistic approach, and the medical ships are founded on the basic premise that it is everyone's right to be given the opportunity to live life to the fullest. I want to live has become a theme for the ministry of YWAM medical ships operating in Papua New Guinea. As one of our doctors has said, we looked despair in the eye and said, you do not have the final word. New Guinea consists of 1,361 islands and 7 million people who speak 800 languages. One in five women die in childbirth. One in 13 children die of treatable diseases. I would now like to share just one final story. Mikasi had been blind for 10 years. When her family heard that a YWAM medical ship was in their area, she paddled a canoe with her husband and children for two weeks to get to the ship's location. After a 45-minute operation, her sight was restored to perfect vision. She saw her three children for the first time that day. She went from being a person with no hope to someone with light in her eyes and hope for the future. In Papua New Guinea, over 8,747 people were served with primary health care, dental, water sanitation, medical care, and eye care in the Boja district alone in 2016. In the Madang district, 14,088 were served in 2016. In the Sumkar district, 21,030 people were helped in 2016. These statistics relate to just one of our smaller YWAM medical ships. YWAM. Youth with a Mission, YWAM, is a global movement of Christians from many cultures, age groups, and Christian traditions dedicated to serving Jesus throughout the world. We unite in a common purpose to know God and to make Him known. Founded in 1960, YWAM operates in more than 1,400 locations in 180 countries and currently has a staff of over 25,000. YWAM medical ships exist to serve the most isolated and disadvantaged people. Using our medical ships to access these villages is not just the best option, it's the only one. We bring hope to the least reached. Julie Dawson, YWAM, Youth with a Mission. YWAMships.org, YWAMships.net. This chapter has been narrated by Kate Robinson.